about computer vision and deep learning, mostly about computer vision and data representation about feature extraction. So computer vision is it's just one sub-area of uh, artificial intelligence. It deals with understanding digital image and or sequence of digital image when we are talking about uh, videos. Research in computer vision have been trying to mimic how people are understanding images and this has been going on for the last 50 years or so, but where are we today? How are actually people understanding images? Right? Uh, I've been teaching uh, a course in artificial intelligence for several years now and every time I go to class, I ask some of my students, how do you recognize a face? I mean, if you know how you actually recognize a face, you see me today and then uh, a year from now, my students look at me on the streets and say, Hi, Dr. Jodaji. Hi, Professor. So how do they store that information in their long-term memory? If we know that, then we can actually duplicate that into computers, right? But most people, especially men, men women are better in that, in that regard. Obviously, we know that, right? They are better in color understanding, they are better in long-term memory, they are better in almost everything, right? <laughs> uh, there have been some research actually to validate that. And this is a problem. The way we extract features from images is not the same as the way computers extract features from images. That's, I think, the big gap between machine learning, computer vision, and actual people. So that's what I would like to talk about today. Uh, this is a paper written in 2001 by Professor Biden and his colleagues. Professor Biden was uh, my professor in Sharmas University when I was doing my PhD. And he said that women are actually better in uh, understanding face recognition. And they're much better in face recognition. For example, he did uh, a web-based research. He presents an image, shows it for a few seconds, and then you look at it for a few seconds, and then he shows you different versions of that face, like side views, portrait views, motion blur views, average blurring, different types of filters are applied, and then you pick which face actually corresponds to those faces. And there were eight different experiments in this research, and in all the eight experiments, women are found to be much, much better than men in understanding uh, the way reality is presented to them. Uh, look at this, for example. You, you see a front view of image, and then you have to identify that image from different side views within a few seconds. And also, currently, uh, the same people in uh, Shamus University are trying to work on can we recognize a face from half an image? Because most people, the, the faces of People are symmetric, right? So half of the image is actually enough to recognize a face. So they're trying to work on a lot of research on that, but I'm not talking about that today. For example, here, the negative image of a person. So by looking at that face, can you actually pick up which one of these faces correspond to the face at the top? And again, like I said, <laughs> OK, which one is it? <laughs> Yes. So, there are different experiments, different kinds of layers and occlusions have been applied on the images, and still women came out on top. So, can we, if we understand how people actually recognize objects, uh, despite occlusions and different kinds of noises in the image, then we can be better at computer vision as well. For example, look at this image, who is this guy? <laughs> President Trump, right? But if you give this to the computers, how about this one? Still the same, right? But can you extract features that actually will enable you to understand this from these features? Or this? It's the same, right? People can simply look at these pictures and understand what we are looking for, what we are looking at. But for computers, so if you look at the first image, for example, color is not one of the features that we are looking at, right? 
And even the nozzles and the, and the light, I don't know how these uh, cartoon designers understand how people are actually recognizing objects. Because if there is a famous person, they can depict it in any way they like, and we can still know who those people are. It's not about the features. It's about the ages, is it, really? Because that's the main thing that we have to understand about feature extraction. If we can understand that, then we can duplicate that. If we don't understand it, then that's the difficult part of computer vision. That's why they have never been as good as people, and they will never be as good as people in the near future. What if we change his face to black? Will people still recognize it? Of course, right? Without any color, they can recognize it. So what do people focus on in an image? That's what we have to look at. Are the features we extract in computer vision similar to those people actually extract when they are looking at an image? This is a big research area. We have been extracting features for several years now, and we are still no way near the capacity of humans. So there has to be some problem with us, right? With computer vision scientists. Or the way images are captured by our devices, right? The sampling, the quantization, etc. So neurologists, biologists, cartoonists, and these kinds of people must work together to understand how people are actually coherent. Because this is a tacit knowledge, right? It's not easy to explain what kind of knowledge or what kind of steps you use to recognize an object. It's very tacit. It's, it's hidden in our mind. It's innate. It's some of it is learned, and still, it's very, very hard to recognize. Think of this picture, for example. You have a two-year-old child, let's say. And then at home, you have this different children book, and you show this image, and then you have this is an elephant. A, a two-inch tall picture in just borders, right? Black and white. And then, 10 years later, you take him to a zoo, and he sees this image. And he says, that's an elephant. Moving, probably several occlusions, completely different in terms of size, in terms of color, in terms of appearance, and he can still match this to each size picture on a children's book to a real life object. How can you do that? This is the thing, this, these are the things that we have to understand in images. Because extracting features, we have been doing that for a long time again. So, to reach the image understanding ability of humans, a two year old child, we are still 50 years away from it. A long way from it. That's why we have to work on the way we represent present data. Right? What did we miss? Where are we going wrong? Because when you look at image, there are several applications that have been being implemented in computer vision, in self-driving cars. A person, if you look at anybody, basically they are self-driving, right? Just like a car in a way. Right? They look around, they understand their environment, and they act upon it. Right? They, they, they visualize, they collect data, they process it, and they act upon that. So we want cars to do that, just like people. We are doing that. But the way we understand images, if people have... Now, self-driving cars are becoming better and better in terms of reducing the accidents and so on. But self-driving cars have eyes in every direction. People have eyes only in the front, right? So you can't see what's coming on this side, but a car can, right? And they can communicate to different devices, like from road infrastructure, like a red light or anything. But people cannot do that. They have to see and look at the image and understand what's actually in that. If you have eyes at the back and on the side, eight eyes, then probably accidents will decrease, right? <laughs> Obviously. On top of, of course, not texting and not talking about well on the phone and the like. So computer vision can be applied in a number of things. So with navigation, face fingerprint, iris, face recognition and the like. Character recognition, applied, I mean, it's been applied in uh, male sorting, license plate recognition, and the like. 
There are several applications, and these applications require a large amount of data, which is existing now, I mean, from everywhere, right? This large amount of data has to be processed in some way, and the more the data is, the more features you have to extract, right? Because the way we represent images is not the way our mind understands images. So it's from the representation itself that is something that's been going on. Look at this image, for example. They say that an image is worth a thousand words, right? If I ask every one of you what you see in this image, what you tell me depends on your background, your interest, your research area, what you like, the colors you like, everything is different. So annotation becomes extremely difficult for images because everyone has a different perspective, right? But when we bring this to a digital image, what we saw? Intensity. That's it. Intensity. And we have to work on that to understand this infinite level of uh, abstraction in images. Right? So that's where we have to work on. Design of cameras, design of pixels. For example, an image is simply a 2D uh, reconstruction of a 3D uh, reality, right? So sample. So in the sample, it depends on the resolution of the camera, the resolution of the images, and the sample data has to be quantized. How much information you saw on each pixel depends on quantization. Now, when you convert it to 2D image, a lot of information is lost. Right? Something always loses information. That depends on your interest, right? How much storage you have, what kind of compression technique you use, and so on. Computer visual researchers try to make sense and understand the context and the meaning of every pixel because when a person looks at an image, every point has a meaning. But for a computer, every point is just a number, right? There's no relationship at all. But for text, that's not the same. If you look at, at the bottom A, because text, the structure of the, the characters is for people. It's not for the computer. For the computer, A is just 65, right, in decimal numbers. But for the computer, for the person, because I don't understand 65 as A, I'm given a structure. But that structure has a code for the computer. But for, for images, we don't have that. For every object that we see, we don't have a code in the computer system, only for intensities. So can we do that? Can we create systems? Because we are trying, once we create the images, we are trying to extract features to make them become like characters, to make them coded, right? We apply face detection systems in our cameras. We put on some additional software in our cameras, in our mobile phones, we can detect faces and put a square or a circle on them. Can we do that built in? Can we apply that? So the representation part is what's difficult. In the eyes of the computer, the image of a laptop and the image of the web the laptop are simply a collection of pixels, right? So we try to extract features and learn or get some meaning out of the pixels to say that these two images actually mean the same thing. But for the computer, they're not. And for computer vision researchers, they're not. We are trying to make them the same, right? To give the same sense. But if you write the word laptop in text editor, then the meaning of this word, the structure which is given for the people, and the meaning of the word which is given in quotes for the computer are actually the same, right? So the representation part becomes difficult. The features that we extract are difficult, especially the manual extraction of features, like in machine learning, in traditional machine learning. Because in traditional machine learning, features are extracted manually, right? We extract the features, we vectorize them, and then we submit them as an input nodes, with files and etc. And then those features are the ones that will be learned. This is a difficulty. Because when the performance of these systems become lower, then we try to increase more features. How many more? So we go to deep learning, the concept of deep learning. Right? The idea of uh, 
convolutional neural networks is not new, by the way, it's, it's over 30 years old, right? it's 1989. But because of lack of large amount of data which is required for deep learning and lack of computational resources, which is not as abundant as it is today in the, 19th, uh, in the 1980s, the deep learning concept was shadowed by the success of machine learning approach like uh, decision trees, uh, support vector machines, and the like. So people were not really into that. But then the amount of data we have starts to grow, right? And, and the computational resources, well, they double every couple of years, right? So people start to look into different ways of extracting better features and improving the performance of their learning algorithms. So in 2012, Image Nights Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge was started, and several people got involved, and the challenge always attracts people, right? And these challenges, several people participated, and the result was amazing. The amount of data that they had was about 1.2 million images at a time, with 1,000 classes. And we can't really apply machine learning, standard traditional machine learning approach, and work on this to get some results. So they went into, they jumped into deep learning and several results were found. ImageNet, everybody knows, it's, it's a collection of images uh, with annotations, with thousands of annotations. Most of these annotations are taken from actually the nouns in, in WebNet, right? They have seen sets. For each seen set, they are planning to get a lot of images. So they are annotated, but the annotation may not always be right. It's manually annotated. And as I said earlier, annotation is always dependent on the perception of the, the people, right? Because if I stand in this position, and if I'm talking on a picture, some people may say, well, this is a conference, right? DSA conference. And some people may write, this is Dereje, presenting in a conference, or simply Dereje, picture of Dereje, right? So the annotations could be different, and we're trying to train the system because this would be used as a level ML. The annotation would be used as a level, and the features that we extract, whether automatically using deep learning techniques, cascaded deep learning systems, or manually, will be used as independent variables. So after this time, after 2012, several people kept on working on deep learning and several algorithms. Uh, have improved the way we understand images. Uh, I've already said this today. The problem of uh, large data sets is not, is not an issue anymore because we have so much data, especially in social networks. ImageNet itself, uh, large scale databases. Wikipedia, eBay, Amazon, and the like, they all contain large amount of data, and that data has to be used somehow for future decision making. And for that purpose, manually analyzing that data and extracting passwords is not possible. So we use deep learning. Deep learning as defined by Yandu uh, and deep learning and loss computational models that are composed of multiple processing layers, as I said, uh, the features are extracted automatically to unsupervised and supervised methods. The unsupervised part usually creates a cluster of the image based on some sort of similarity. And then that similarity will be taken at the class level and will be used again for extraction of certain blocks of image data from each part. And then sub-imaging those finally to get at large amount of uh, features that will be used for the training. Because an image is simply uh, a matrix of numbers, right? And these matrix of numbers are huge. Just for one image, one object in the middle, you will still have millions of pixels. So the amount of data we work on computer vision is extremely large. And the processing power that's required when you're actually processing, for example, in the 2012 challenge, 1.2 million records is immense. In fact, the challenge winners, they have to train their system on GPUs. It's very hard to work on GPUs on image processing. 
on GPUs, which is much faster, well, 50 times probably faster than CPUs, and they have to train the system for two weeks to get a result. I'm very proud of it. So, the first thing is representation learning method, learning good features automatically from raw data, learning representations of data with multiple levels of abstraction, because you extract a certain feature from a block of an image, and then from those features, again, you extract another features, and you keep on going. So you can have one layer, two layer, the hidden layers, the number of hidden layers define the amount of abstraction left. And the amount of features that we extract from each block of image is also growth exponential. So the processing power required for deep learning, especially when it comes to computer vision, will be uh, very high. So deep learning is hierarchical, compositional deep, cascade of nonlinear transformation. Parts of the image will be taken and extracted. Uh, you can extract different, for example, double features or shift features and the like. End to end learning, because you don't extract the features separately. You give it an image and you get an output, right? Uh, distribution representation, no single neural inputs, everything. So you have different uh, neurons encoding one thing instead of the other way around. So you have multiple uh, uh, number of features for each specific object or for each specific block of image. So the image is divided into some images and features are extracted, example using double filters with specific scaling orientation. Double filters work to extract features in different orientations and different scales, right? Uh, on the filter cell images, other features such as vertical lines, horizontal lines, edges, and so on are extracted. This will go on for several layers. But the more layers you have, the more features you can extract, and the more complex the system becomes. But the recognition accuracy could increase. But you have also to think about the cost of the animation, right? As the time uh, the animation grows, the performance might also decrease. It's an end to end transition. As I said, uh, we have a novel image an input and the classification as an output. There's no feature extraction as a separate entity from the learning algorithm. Layer the automatic feature extraction and hierarchical features. So this is the representation, as you can see the vertical line. Uh, you can turn by turning on and off different parts of an image feature, you can actually represent a pattern. Right? Different types of patterns or the combination. For example, Two vertical lines and a horizontal line connecting them at the middle is an edge. Right? So, or two vertical lines and a horizontal line connecting them at the bottom is actually a U. So each of the objects are extracted and the way they are connected is also an information and using this information you can actually create recognition systems or classification systems. So the different features, as you can see, different blocks of the image are taken and different features. For example, in the first and second layers, you can extract edges. In the third layers, you can extract object parts. In the fourth layers, additional things, for example, color or intensity changes and the like. You go on and finally, uh, you recognize the different objects in the image uh, as a combination of these features. So you give it an image and at the end, you get a model. And for evaluation and actual development purposes, you give it a novel image and you get the result of the classification at the end. So this is basically the structure. Uh, these are several layers, 650,000 neurons in each of uh, in all the several layers, 60 million parameters. These are the 2012 winners of the uh, uh, image uh, next challenge. They train the system on two GPUs which are much faster, about 50 times faster, for a week to get the results, which is about 16.5 percent error, or a thousand classification levels. If you try to do that on um, traditional machine learning system, it's impossible. Why deep learning improves choice for computer vision, large amount of data, large amount of levels, classification levels. Deep learning provides meaning for the numbers in the image matrix. Uh, the pixels, so it's not a choice anymore. We are already forced into deep learning. 
So I can imagine a presentation. Here's just an idea for future. Right? Because if you take a mobile camera or any camera, it takes a picture, and then once the picture is stored in the computer system, we go back and try to extract features and then embed it back onto the picture. Why not do it the other way around? Would it be possible? How many cores do we need? If you look at Unicode, for example, for every character, I think for a huge number of uh, character shapes around the world, for a huge number of languages, they have cores, right? But they are finite, yes. For images, they are infinite, and the amount of cores you need will be staggering, they are high. But will it be possible to think about cameras which can actually code the image, sort of automated annotation, while the image is being captured? Will that be a possibility? I think there is a future idea for, for research, but definitely the, uh, it will have a huge amount of challenges like scale, orientation, how many cores we need for each orientation. For example, if you have 360 degree rotation in just one two dimensional plane, then at least you need 360 codes for each object. And occlusions, background, foreground, areas of interest, or is it really necessary if you are going to code the whole image set? So this is something to think about. I mean, it could be a future research area. Some people are working on it, but not uh, published yet. So thank you. Uh, okay. seeing it, right? It's an instant thing, right? You see an image and you say, this is a guy, this is a dog. Or in a huge set of images with different kinds of objects, you can still recognize it instantly. It's not like we put it in our mind and then we extract features, recognize them, and so on. It's not like that. So everything is done at the time of capture. Can we do that with images, the same way we do that in, in text characters? At least we should start somewhere and try to see what its effects will be in computer vision. That's just an idea. First of all, hello? I can hear you. Okay, there you go. Um, first of all, I want to thank the professor for you know, doing a good job explaining the challenge with respect to representation within computer vision. Um, my question might actually be both for you and for anyone else in the audience. Um, my question is, so recently we've seen a lot of work within engineering and biotechnology with respect to using um, nanobots and nanotechnology um, to do you know, drug delivery, surgical uh, processes and things of that nature. So specifically with regards to like, nanobots and things of that nature, um, are you aware of you know, research being done 
um, to implement computer vision with these nanobots and, um, you know, what does that look like, if that makes sense? Uh, I have seen some, some, some articles from Las Vegas, but the thing is, nanobots or it's anything that has a camera in it, inserted in your body, in some method, is designed to recognize certain types of objects right? on a specific domain. And they recognize the, the, those objects and they send back signals. That image is recognized and they can tell you what they are, right? Medical imaging or other types of learning algorithms, decision making algorithms can be applied on the signals that are sent back. But they work on specific domain specific uh, subjects, domain specific areas. For example, some could be uh, understanding the types of blood or simple. Uh, areas of bacteria, looking at bacteria in the stomach and so on. You can insert something and they can look at the surrounding area, send back some signals and say, well, this is the problem that we have. Or in surgery, they can be applied to see uh, where the surgery needs to be applied, right? So, I can't say I'm an expert in that area, but computer vision is applied on anything that's related to images. As long as an image signal is sent back to the system from wherever that is, from inside your body, from inside your blood streams, or from anywhere, then computer vision can be applied. I don't know if I have answered your question. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have very many questions, but I'll just stick to the ones that I, that I can ask here. So, um, you say, uh, I just wanted to know, do you think, in your opinion, the problem we're having is with the way we're representing our data or the current architectures we're using? Because if it is the data, do you think maybe representing as pixels is not the best way we can represent our images for computer vision? Uh, are there other ways we, we, sh we could or can represent these images? And also, and also I want to know if um, you up the up way you were suggesting for representing it, like codifying everything, Unicode, want to just increase the dimensions and, and then give us the same class of dimensionality we're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, I'm not saying images are not the right way to represent, but what we put in the images, the pixels, don't give us any information, except intensity, right? Fraction of light. So, the features are not there in the image. We have to find a way to extract them. And the only thing that we have in the images is change in intensity. The only thing that we have is change in intensity, right? That's why most of the time we work on the frequency domain after transforming the image rather than the sparkle domain, which is less visible right, to the computer system. So, what I'm saying is it's just an idea that it's not been worked on yet. What I'm saying is, Image should be there, some form of digital representation of reality. But when we represent that reality, can we include features as well? Instead of extracting the features better from a collection of pixels, which only contain numbers, not related with one another, can we do that? Can we do the feature representation or the codification, the automated annotation as part of the image capture? That's basically what uh, I'm trying to suggest. Yes, dimensionality will increase because unlike text, which has a finite number of cores required, in images you have infinite, right? I mean, everything, but can we start somewhere at least for specific domains and then see where it goes from there? Because technology usually tries to solve a problem. So understanding the problem is the, the, the first part. How do people recognize objects? Because I don't think there is an answer to that yet. If we knew that, then we can come up with a better representation mechanism which will help in understanding images of any visual data the way that humans do. Uh, 
the domain of computer vision, as I know, that used in a security box of use. As an example, in a surveillance system, you can find line crossing, region out, region in, and another. And there are also something that is called forensic search. You can have a video, and you get the two image for a person, or for a car, or for whatever you want, and then it will tell you that it is appearing in the first minute, or ten minutes, after one hour, after two hours, then. Then the most used is of computer vision, as I know, in security. Also, there is lots of uses, but it is rare, as I think. That is what I know. Thank you. Well, it is not a question, so... Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for your nice presentation. My question is, you say that in this office, we humans understand images instantly, but I was thinking about this, and we humans are understanding images instantly because we have been trained many, many years, for many years. Even a kid, for example, when I was born, I couldn't understand images, I couldn't understand the background, but through learning, now I became, so that I can understand anything around me. But if I face anything, any new thing that I haven't seen before, unless it is labeled, I mean, can you say that you can understand that image? Because a processor, when we consider, as you say, a camera to understand an object, it has, I mean, the camera is seeing that object only for that moment. It hasn't seen that picture before. It hasn't told us that picture is something. So how can we make processors to understand like human beings? Because as I told you, human beings, I believe that human beings understand images because they are trained people. Yes, they are trained. People are trained, but they can still recognize images. You have been trained for, let's say, if you are a 10-year-old boy, then trained for 10 years. But let's say you go to somewhere where you haven't seen anything. The space, for example, or the moon, or somewhere that you have never been before. You can still see objects they recognize. And machines are also trained, by the way. Machines, we train them. That's why we call it machine learning. So you show an object, you show my face, you train it with my face, with different versions of my face, applying different kinds of noises. And then next time I come along, because it's already trained to recognize me, it should recognize me, right? But always with some sort of errors. If you try to decrease the error by minimizing the distance between the object, the normal object, and what has been stored or what has been learned, then performance will go down, right? I mean, it has a negative effect. So you always have to look for features that are optimal, right? And there's always a threshold issue, an optimal threshold issue, because there's always a measure of distance, right? Between what you have stored, what you have learned, and what you are looking at now. So the accuracy, the confidence level, the moment you start to decrease it, errors will come in, false negatives, false positives. The moment you increase it, false negatives will increase. So machines do learn, but even for those things that they have learned about, the feature extraction is so poor that they are never near the ability of humans. That's what I'm saying. People have learned, yes, you have been learning for some years by looking at your surrounding and understanding what it is. And machines have been learning for the last 50 years. And yet, the ability of humans to recognize objects and the ability of machines to recognize objects are annoying all each other. That's what I'm saying. Okay, uh, there's no more. One last question. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Just um, about this, these differences between the way humans learn 
it seems one important difference is that we interact with our lawyers and we have to understand some causality as well between the cases. You know, what happens if I, I push this or I do yeah. this? Uh, um, I mean, do you think maybe that could be one of the ingredients that we seem to be missing, which uh, perhaps makes the, the human representation richer? You know, we have this kind of understanding rather than simple kind of template to change, which many of our models maybe do now. Well, not just from actual realistic objects, but even from images which we cannot hold, we can still understand, right? So that means, looking at an image, I can see some things that I cannot touch, I cannot interact with, and yet understand. But for computer vision, that's still so far away from us, right? From, from images, not from just reality, but even looking at the picture, you can understand a lot of things. But computers are so far from that. Yes, learning, right. We learn, we learn by interacting, but yeah, it's true. Time. true, true. Okay, uh, we're going to thank Professor. <laughs> Very stimulating talk. Uh, thank you, Professor. So we're going to switch the... We're going to switch